uh, hierarchical linear models, or mixed models, or multi-level models, whatever you want to call them. I don't care, we're going to talk about them. So, we use multi-level models or mixed models when we have non-independent data. You remember that assumption we kind of talked about, the independence assumption, didn't spend much time with? Well, that's kind of important. And what does the assumption of independence mean? It basically means your scores are not correlated with one another. And no, I'm not talking about your X and your Y, or your independent and your dependent variable. Those are supposed to be correlated. We want them to be correlated. What I'm talking about is within a variable, that the first person you record an X for is not going to be related to the second person you record an X for. In other words, whatever person one does shouldn't influence person two. But sometimes that's not an easy assumption to defend. Sometimes we measure the same person multiple times. Or maybe we measure family members, and family members tend to be correlated with one another. Or maybe we measure students who were taught by the same teachers. Or maybe we measure people from the same region. All of these instances mean that we might have correlated data. So now let's talk about it for a minute. Why is this whole independence assumption important? Well, let's use an example. Let's say I believe I can bend the roll of a dice to my will. And I can make it a one. I'm really good at picking up the ones. And so let's say I roll it five times and I get three ones. Bam! I'm amazing. I don't think so. In other words, 60% of the rolls were ones. That's pretty good. So you might ask yourself, okay, what is the probability of that sort of thing happening by chance? And it turns out the probability of getting a one three or more times is 0 0.03. Cool. That's a rare event. But you know, I was really hoping for a really, really low probability. That would be really cool. And so I might think to myself, hmm, I know that if you have a large sample size, your probability estimates will go lower, or your p-values will go lower. So maybe you consider two options. Option number one, you roll the dice 10 more times. So instead of rolling five times, you roll 15 times. Now, are you gonna get exactly the same? Are you gonna get 60% ones again? Probably not. So maybe this time you only get one additional one. That's not unlikely. So what is your probability now? At this point, your probability is equal to 0.23, or in other words, you have a 23% chance of getting four ones out of 15. Well, technically, four or more out of 15. So still rare, but not like super rare. Great! So that's one way to increase your sample size, but you might be thinking, huh, if the only thing stopping me from an amazing p-value is a larger sample size, why don't I just double my sample size or triple my sample size? And so if you got three out of five on the first time, why not just pretend you rolled it again and got three out of five the second time and three out of five the third time? And so you would have nine rolls out of 15. And if you compute a probability now, your p-value would be 0.0001 or something like that. Awesome! You didn't have to go through the effort of rolling the dice that many times and you got a lower p-value. Win, win. Well, that's a good idea, I think. No, that's what we call cheating, folks. That's too bad. Why is it cheating? Think of it this way. If your original sample had 60% ones, What's the probability your second sample will be 60% ones? The probability is one. You have a 100% chance of it being exactly the same. Why? Because you duplicated your data set. On the other hand, the probability of getting that exact same thing on independent rolls is gonna be very different. So anytime you're using probability to make decisions, you can't just duplicate your data set, that's cheating. Because the probabilities that you're computing aren't the same as what you think you're computing. So the probability of getting 60% on independent dice rolls is very different from the probability of getting 60% when you have duplicated your data set. Now why in the world am I talking about duplicating my data set? We all know that's wrong. Yes, you're right. Hopefully we do know that. But here's the thing, when we have correlated data set like husband and wife or brother and sister or time one and time two, we are effectively doubling our sample size. So yeah, you find a relationship with the husbands, now you go and collect the wives, guess what? You're probably gonna find the same relationship, but not because the relationship is there, but because whatever you found with the husband is probably gonna be found with the wife because they're not independent. And by the way, of all the assumptions to violate heteroscedasticity, normality, independent, or... What's <laughs> that assumption? Ah, linearity, sorry. Oh, I forgot. Of all the assumptions to violate, the worst is to violate the assumption of independence because you are artificially inflating your probabilities. Because again, we are artificially multiplying our data set. 
those are not truly independent observations. But it happens. Sometimes we have correlated data. Sometimes we have husbands and wives. Sometimes we have people measured more than once. Sometimes we have clusters of people within therapists or something like that. And so we need a way to deal with it. We need statistical procedures that explicitly account for that correlated nature of the data. So back in the day, what we used to do is what's called a repeated measures ANOVA. And we use that by temporarily pretending each subject is like a categorical variable and model the categorical variable. And so each subject has a subject effect. And then at the end of the statistical procedure, there's some sort of a correction that goes on in there. And it's really complicated and really confusing and not fun to deal with at all. And at the end of the day, when we make that correction, it assumes something that we call sphericity. What is sphericity? Don't worry about it. Because it'd be really complicated to tell you and we don't have to worry about it when we're using mixed models. And so back in the day, instead of doing a repeated measures ANOVA, we'd use what's called the multivariate approach. And it's really complicated and really confusing and you don't need to know it. I'm just giving you some appreciation for how amazing mixed models are. So fortunately in the 1900s, there was development in this idea that we have mixed models or hierarchical models or multi-level models. And these multi-level models or hierarchical linear models, they've basically made repeated measures ANOVA completely obsolete. Thank goodness, because they're a B.I. Right side. I find your jokes offensive and distracting. So with that, what are hierarchical linear models? Boy, I'm glad you asked. So we can call them hierarchical linear models or multi-level models or mixed models or mixed effects models. They're basically all the same thing. So or mixed models or HLM, we use that when we have clustering. And so you might have clustering, for example, if you have a bunch of clients who have the same therapist or a bunch of students who have the same teacher or the same person measured multiple times. Again, anytime you suspect your data are correlated, then it's time for HLM or mixed models or whatever. And so here's a handy visual. In this situation, we have Dr. Russell, Dr. Smith, and Dr. Bean, each of which has three patients, patient one, patient two, and patient three for Dr. Russell, etc. And if you were to see it as a data set, it might look something like this where you have patients and you have doctor, which is the name of the variable that indicates the cluster and you have that repeating. That's a good indication that you have mixed models. Or like I said, not only do we have clustering because we have therapists or siblings or schools or classrooms or something like that, but we also have it when we have people measured more than once. So here's an example where we got Dustin. That's me! Measured three times, time one, time two, and time three, as well as Matt and Lexi. So again, anytime you collect multiple measurements from the same person, you can't treat those measurements as if they're independent. Otherwise, you're gonna screw something up. You remember the problem that we talked about earlier where you're effectively doubling your sample size? Well, not only can that happen, but you can also be misled in pretty dramatic ways. So let's look at an example. So suppose we have this image which shows a relationship between symptom severity and the proportion of people who survive when they go to a hospital. And it seems to be from this graph, there's actually a slightly positive that the more severe your symptoms are, the more likely you are to survive. Awesome! Let's wait until we're on our deathbed before going to the hospital. That's a good idea. Yeah, that would be a bad idea. Why? Well, let's see what happens when we color code the data. So here we have red, green, and blue indicating the different hospitals. Red is in and out, green is Cyprus, and blue is University Medical. And so it seems to be that University Medical only accepts patients with super severe symptoms. So maybe it's a specialty hospital that has only the top of the line experts or something like that. Whereas with the in and out hospital, it tends to be people with less severe symptoms. And so within a cluster, what you see is you actually see a negative relationship. As expected, the more severe your symptoms are, the lower your probability of surviving. And we wouldn't know that unless we used hierarchical linear models. What hierarchical linear models do, or mixed models do, is they essentially fit a separate regression line for each and every cluster. So looking back at our hospital example, notice there's a line for in and out and a line for Cyprus, and a line for University Medical. And then what it does is it estimates what we call the fixed slope. Or basically, you can kind of think of it as the average slope between severity and symptoms across all hospitals. And here's what that looks like, which is the solid black line there. So the colored lines we call the random effects, and the black thick line we call the fixed effects. So let me summarize what we're talking about so far. Basically, if we treat individuals within a cluster as if they're independent, we're probably gonna screw things up in one way or another. Either we're gonna inflate our probability estimates or we're gonna miss the nature of the relationship entirely. We don't wanna do that. Because again, the purpose of data analysis is to find out what your data are trying to tell you. So HLM or mixed models more or less fit separate regression lines for each and every cluster. In reality, it's a little more complicated than that, but not that much more complicated. And the complication, which 
you don't really have to know, is that it will estimate a line per slope, but it will tend to bias it towards the fixed effect, especially if your cluster has a small sample size. Every cluster has its own regression line, simple enough. But we also have some decision. We can decide that we don't want the slopes to vary between groups. We want all the slopes to be exactly the same. Or maybe we want to say, all right, the slopes can vary, but the intercepts have to be fixed. The intercepts always have to start at the exact same point. And you can do that. And so those parameters that we fix, we call fixed effects. And those parameters that we let vary, we call those random effects. A random effect means that every single cluster's parameter is going to be different. By the way, I'm kind of sort of misleading you at this point just to simplify things, but we'll complicate it later and that's okay. So again, fixed effects, everybody gets the same slope or intercept or whatever. Random effects, every cluster has their own unique slope and intercept. So I'm going to show you a bunch of different examples of what it might look like to fix certain parameters and let others freely vary. So here's what we would call a random slopes and random intercepts model. These are probably the most common. Very often people want the slopes and the intercepts to vary across clusters. Not always, but very often. So in this situation we have paneled on group. There's group one, group two, and group three. And notice that each of those has their own unique regression line. And so each of those has no fixed effects. Again, I'm lying to you. There is a fixed effect here, but I'm gonna complicate that later, not right now. And here's an example where we have a random slopes model, which means we have fixed the intercept to be the same for everyone. And notice that those lines all basically start at the same point. Now, the only reason why they don't exactly start at the same point is because X doesn't go to zero. But if it started at zero, you would see that all those lines start at the exact same point. By the way, it's very rare to do this sort of a model. Normally, you don't want to fix the slopes. It's kind of a bad idea. But conceptually, I want to show you what it looks like when you fix different parts of the model and let other parts of the model freely vary. So again, the intercept is exactly the same. All groups start from the same place, but their slopes are allowed to vary. So theoretically, what this is saying is that each cluster has a different slope, but they have the same intercept. And I can't think of a theoretical situation where this would actually make sense, where you want to fix the intercept, but not the slope. It just seems kind of weird to me, but you might be in a situation where you need to do that. So once again here, the slopes are random because they vary across groups, whereas the intercept is fixed because they are identical across groups. And now let's look at an example of a random intercepts model. So in this model shown here, notice that the intercepts are allowed to vary, but the slopes are fixed to be exactly the same. And this is pretty common. It's not unusual to fix the slopes. So with this model, each cluster has its own unique mean or its random effects mean. And their mean deviates from what we might call the grand mean or the global mean or the fixed effect mean. And that's the complication that I'll get to in a minute. But here again, the slopes are fixed, which is basically theoretically saying that the relationship between your predictor and your outcome is identical across groups. There is no variability in the slope. Again, this is not an unreasonable assumption, especially if you have categorical data. So here's an example where we are modeling a fixed effect of male versus female differences. So maybe Y, for example, could be height. Of course, people aren't 15 feet tall, but you get the idea. <laughs> and maybe the groups one, two, and three here represent different schools. And there's no reason to suspect that the average difference between males and females in one school should be any different than the average difference between males and females in another school. So it makes sense to have a fixed slope here. So I'm sure you're asking at this point, okay, great, we can fix slopes, we can fix intercepts. How do I decide? Generally, but not always, we allow the intercepts to vary. And whether you fix the slopes or not depends on theory. But in either case, always let theory be your guide. And basically what you wanna do is whenever you add a predictor, you want to ask yourself, do I expect the slopes to be consistent across clusters? If so, we would model it as a fixed effect only. Which again, fixed means everybody gets the same slope, regardless of whatever cluster you belong to. If not, if you think that they might be consistent across clusters, then you add a random effect. And again, random effect means every cluster has their own slope. Again, let theory be your guide. If you don't have theory to guide you, or if you can't quite tell, well, categorical variables very often probably usually have fixed slopes. Again, going back to our previous example, the difference between males and females in height should be consistent regardless of your cluster. And if you have numeric variables, usually you want to vary the slopes. For example, the relationship between anxiety and depression, that's probably gonna be stronger for some therapists and weaker for other therapists. Probably depends on your expertise in treating anxiety or depression. But always, you can always do it empirically. You could always find out from the data if the data support a fixed versus random effects, which is exactly what I'm gonna show you, but not in this video. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and quiz you. Put your thinking caps on, folks. 
and buckle up, because we're going to do a quiz. So I'm going to show you a bunch of graphs, and you tell me, based on the graph, are the slopes fixed or are they random? Are the intercepts fixed or are they random? So let's look at this one. Leave a comment with your best guess. I always thought that was really stupid when people asked that, because you're going to watch the end of the video, and you're going to find out the answer. So what's the point of leaving a comment? I swear I guess the right answer every time. Anyway. Don't bother leaving a comment with your guess because I'm gonna tell you right now. All right, graph number one. What do we have here? Well, it looks like the, uh, certainly the slopes are varying. And if we were to extend the x-axis over to zero, I'm betting that the intercepts are fixed. So we would call this a random slopes model. How about the next one? All right, well, this one, we see height differences. So they are certainly varying in their intercept, but the slopes are identical. In fact, they're identical when they shouldn't be identical. Look at the data. The data tell you, yeah, you need to vary those slopes, dude. So this would be fixed slope, random intercept. Next one. Again, it's hard to tell unless we were to extend the x-axis all the way to zero. It could be a fixed slope model. And in retrospect, I probably should have, I probably should have had the scale go to zero so you could actually tell. But my best guess would be, actually, you know what? They are not fixed intercepts, because if you look at the far right graph over there, notice that those two lines are almost touching, which means that those two graphs don't originate at the same point. So that's going to be a random slope and random intercept model. Now let's look at the last one. All right, that one, let's see. That's again a, a hard one to tell. Um, I would probably guess it's going to be a fixed intercept model. Because, yeah, it looks like those lines will all converge on about the same point. So now that we have concluded our very unclear example of whether the intercept is fixed, let's go ahead and review our learning objectives. Number one, what is the assumption of independence? The assumption of independence means that people within your sample are uncorrelated with one another. Again, you can have correlations between variables, but not within a variable. They should not be correlated within a variable. Number two, two reasons why violating the assumption of independence is problematic. Number one, you are artificially doubling or tripling or quadrupling or whatever your sample size, which again means your probability estimates are going to be inflated. You're going to be much more likely to make a type one error. And number two, the nature of the relationship may be masked. So again, in our hospital example, the average relationship, if you ignored the clustering, was slightly positive. But once we accounted for the clustering, it was actually negative across all those hospitals. Number three, understand the difference between mixed models, hierarchical linear models, multi-level models, mix effects models, and there is no difference. They are all the same thing. The terms are used interchangeably. Although there are some differences once you get at a super complicated level, but we're not gonna get into that level. So for your purposes, they're all the same. Number four, understand geometrically what a mixed model is doing. And again, all it's doing is it is fitting separate regression lines for each cluster mostly. Again, it's going to bias it towards a fixed effect, but basically that's what it's doing. Number five, 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 I think five, understand what fixed and random effects are. Again, fixed effects means it is the same for every single cluster, whereas random effects means every cluster has different ones. So it could be a fixed slope or a fixed intercept. Number six or whatever number we're on, know the visual representation of each of the following models, random slopes and random intercepts model, random slopes only model, and random intercepts only model. And again, this isn't really a learning objective. Maybe it is, I don't know. Remember, we really don't often do a fixed intercept model. It's just there to help you kind of conceptualize what a fixed versus random effect is. If there are any questions, leave them in the comment section, and I'll see you next time. If I had a nickel for every time someone violated a statistical assumption, I could afford not to live in a van down by the river.